If your doctor writes a prescription for a medication, you'd get it filled and take it, right? But what if the doctor gave you a prescription for food? Would you be surprised? Well, our guest today does just that. He writes prescriptions for recipes that he feels are just as medically healing as some of the drugs he also prescribes. He also recommends forced bathing and regenerative farming and has the evidence to prove that they can be beneficial to our health as well. I don't know about you, but that sounds much more interesting and fun to me than taking a pill. And don't worry if you don't know what those things are. We've got you covered in the second part of this two-episode interview, so make sure to listen to both episodes. In fact, grab a cup of tea and a healthy snack, maybe even sit outside if the weather's good, while we talk to a pioneer in the field of culinary medicine and more. Hi, welcome to Beyond the Paper Gown. I'm Dr. Mitzi Crockover. If you're listening on one of the audio platforms like Spotify or Apple Music, take a moment to subscribe so you can be sure to get our latest episodes as soon as they're available. And just a reminder that while our goal is to inform and educate, our podcast is not intended as a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. I am so happy to welcome Dr. John LaPuma. Um, he and I have known each other for a long time, longer than I think any of us want to uh, um, admit to, um, but uh, he has done a, an incredible amount in that time. Um, he is a board-certified specialist in internal medicine, a professionally trained chef, and an urban organic regenerative farmer. He co-founded Chef MD and is considered the founder of the field of culinary medicine. He's also a New York Times bestselling author or co-author of seven books, which have been translated into 10 languages and selling over a million copies. He's co-hosted multiple television series, appeared on numerous media outlets, lectured on culinary medicine at TedMed and TEDx, and on nature-based medicine and culinary medicine at the University of Chicago and Harvard University. Like I said, you've been very busy since we first met, John, and welcome to Beyond the Paper Gown. It's a pleasure to be with you again, Mitzi. So great to see you. Thank you. So I remember we actually have spoken at some point between the time we first met and now, and you had told me about taking the chef's course at the Cordon Bleu affiliate in Chicago, and that you had been chefing at one of my favorite restaurants. I just wanted to know what inspired you to become a chef? And and one of my favorite restaurants. We're talking about <laughs> the Topolo Bombo in Chicago right. and the Frontera Grill, Rick Bevis's first two restaurants in Chicago. And he's expanded his uh, work since then and is continuing to thrive. Uh, I love cooking. I love being a chef as well as a doctor and now a farmer. And what inspired me is that it always made me feel good to feed people. And I needed a way to try to help them as a doctor in uh, other than simply writing prescriptions and sending them to a dietitian and handing out pamphlets. So I really went to cooking school to learn how to make a healthy diet taste good. And uh, I was lucky to have great teachers and that and still do. How do you integrate that into your work as a physician? Well, as you know, I write recipes on prescription slips and have been able to teach in books and television and other media quite a lot. Um, I always ask my patients what they eat and, and what it's like for them uh, as they choose food and whether they have a garden and grow food. Give us an example of what kind of prescriptions you write and what kinds of issues that are addressed by diet. The kinds of recipes that I write on prescription strips are, are simple are few ingredients, require little processing, and are often recipes for the week. Um, I, it's much easier to cook in quantity than it is to cook one meal at a time or two meals at a time. And so, you know, roasting a whole chicken with uh, whole carrots and potatoes and sweet potatoes and uh, onions uh, is a simple thing to do, but it will feed you for the whole week. Um, and, and the pan should be full. Um, and knowing how to roast and how simple that can be is often rewarding because it can be juicy and delicious and full of herbs and spices as well. 
Now you mentioned chicken, so you're not prescribing a vegetarian diet. I think people are omnivorous. I'm omnivorous. Um, I think eating vegetarian or vegan is a healthful way to eat, no question about it. And some of the best data that exists about uh, eating patterns, whether it's vegan or vegetarian or Mediterranean or Asian or um, lacto-ovo, um, suggest that eating way more plants than we do as a country and way less meat as than we do as a country is better for us. But most people still eat poultry, and I think there's some um, uh, there's a lot of value to poultry. It's a um, uh, it can be made flavorful, although it's not flavorful, I think, by itself, and um, it's, it's still a relatively inexpensive food that's high in protein and um, uh, relatively low in fat that you can dress up in lots of ways that um, make it. Uh, appear at least on a side plate. I think most meats belong on a side plate rather than in the middle of the plate. You know, both of us spent a good deal of time in the Midwest, you and I, <laughs> and in Chicago, it really wasn't dinner unless there was a hunk of something in the middle of the plate. And there's <laughs> nothing wrong with that once in a while, I think. Um, but I do think that we need to meet people where they are. And, and the term vegan turns off a lot of people. And so it's better, I think, to eat uh, uh, a plant-rich diet if you can and um, find new and fun and delicious ways to do that. And what general recommendations and would you suggest to our listeners that they could be implementing in their diet to, to be more healthy? Oh, I think the first step is to not worry about being perfect. <laughs> you know, I think that we hear so much dietary advice and so much um, – uh, switching of nutrition expertise that it can get frustrating and you can just like eat Kentucky fried chicken every day. And um, that's probably not the right move, but it's certainly understandable because um, uh, people are very frustrated and stressed with this kind of uh, not knowing what the best thing is. So the first rule is to not worry about being perfect. The second is that um, you can and should find vegetables and fruits that you think are delicious and eat them every day. And I, I, you know, I've written books in which I've suggested that people ought to eat, you know, five vegetables and four fruits a day. And that probably is the optimal number from the, all the science that we have. At least it's a good contender. But I think hitting a number like that makes it too hard for most people. So I rather just, if you like bananas and apples, eat bananas and apples. Um, eat an organic apple because the synthetic artificial chemical that, are, that apples are sprayed with both during the way they grow and after growth is not great. In fact, is probably an endocrine disruptor. What is the importance of that then? When you endocrine, endocrine disruption, as, as, as you know, because you're an expert in women's health, is... Um, is incredibly important for women, not just uh, women of childbearing age, but uh, perimenopausal and menopausal women as well, because um, when synthetic artificial chemicals like pesticides and herbicides and fungicides, which are so used in conventional farming, um, and pesticides are used in organic farming, by the way, but they're not synthetic artificial and chemical, and they don't screw up your endocrine system like uh, the synthetics do. Uh, change the way that your body responds to other hormones. It changes the way that you sleep, the way that you digest, the way that you um, that you conduct yourself. It changes your energy level. It changes your susceptibility to other immune insults. It's really the immune system that um, synthetics act upon. And, and we see this not just with uh, cancers in patients with especially breast cancer and, and um, colon cancer with people exposed to um, pesticides and fungicides and herbicides, but also leukemias and lymphomas. The second and most important dietary advice is to eat a fruit and vegetable every day that you like and think about them as potential snacks. Um, I 
an apple is a pretty easy thing to grab as a snack. People don't like to grab it because then they have to throw away half if they don't eat the whole thing. But through the magic of vitamin C and marketing, we now have eighth apples that are sprinkled with vitamin C that do not rust or oxidize when, uh, if you leave them out. Now that's great advice. How long does it take for people to see effects from changing their diets? Well, food works within the body within minutes, but with the effects that you feel can sometimes take days or weeks. I mean, if, if you eat a handful of walnuts with a fast food meal, a handful being seven, you, the brachial artery, which is the main artery in your arm, releases its spasm from the crap that the junk food has given you and has better oh, wait, flow. So you're saying I can go to Popeye's, pig out, and just eat seven almonds and I'm done? Walnuts, but yes. <laughs> walnuts, okay, walnuts. <laughs> yes, you can. Um, and you should at least eat the walnuts. So, exactly. um, um, yeah, no, I mean, food acts within minutes. Huh. By rever- in that case, by reversing endothelial dysfunction and arterial spasm um, through a mechanism that I think is not well delineated, but it it's it does. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of little tricks with food. I mean, with uh, if you want to decaffeinate a tea bag, a tea, you soak the tea bag for thirty seconds. All the caffeine comes out. You throw away the tea, and then you soak the tea bag again for three minutes and you get an almost as strong cup of tea. Um, You can bake a pizza at um, a hotter or longer at 450 or for 14 minutes instead of shorter uh, and at lower temperatures um, and improve the whole wheat in uh, antioxidants and their bioavailability in a pizza crust. So just by baking differently, um, you you can add a little bit of fresh broccoli to your broccoli salad or to your cauliflower or to any other, or your arugula, any other cruciferous vegetable, which is a vegetable that blooms into a four-point cross, which is why it's called cruciferous, and absorb more of the liver detoxifying enzymes that are in the cruciferous vegetable because you have a little bit of fresh with all of it that it's cooked. There are a lot of little tricks to food. We call these water cooler facts and listed <laughs> about a hundred of them in the Chef MD book that I wrote. But the and and they're fun and they give people a hook a way in because, you know, um Again, eating can be overcomplicated, and I think people make it too difficult. It's not hard to eat well or to eat for flavor and eat better than we do, but um, you asked me for the, what people can do now to help. The third thing they can do is to try to avoid anything that you can wad up into a ball and throw across the room. If you're, if you're eating something that you can wad up into a ball and throw across the room, it probably deserves to be a softball instead. Such as? Such as as bread that you can oh, crumble into I thought into you were going to say that. <laughs> well, That's there's bread that. that is substantial. Spices. I love bread. I baked, I baked bread cookies last night, actually, with um, uh, ginger and chocolate chips and jujubes. Do you know what jujubes are? No, what are those? They're Chinese dates. Um, oh. they're, uh, they're not from the movie um, theater. But they. I was going to say, are, I thought it was familiar. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, jujubes are Chinese dates. They're they look okay. like little mini apples, and you can dry them and eat them like uh, like uh, prunes or plums. They usually have a tiny little seed in the middle, uh, and they grow really easily. And so let's get back to. So you said that there are other breads that are okay to eat. That um, for those of us who are. Uh, carb lovers oh i i love bread um and um you know uh, one teacher cooking teacher i had said uh, bread should be a meal in itself you should be able to eat bread without butter 
or honey or whatever else you put on bread. When what he meant by that was um, s- strongly seeded breads, breads that are super dense, that are made with whole grain and whole rye, but not whole wheat flour and whole rye flour, which is basically uh, almost a sugar equivalent. But instead, ones that are, you know, you can pick up and they weigh down your hand as you pick them up. And I, I actually love breads like that. I love the density of bread. I love the feel of it, the weight of it. Uh, if you're looking for a best bread, I like Dave's Killer Bread. Um, mm-hmm. That's available at Costco and lots of other places. Uh, and if you have a bakery in town, go to the baker. Um, there's a there's a bread in town, uh, D'Angelo's Bakery here in Santa Barbara called uh, Rudolf Steiner Bread, um, for the founder of uh, Biodynamics. And um, and that bread is like all pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, whole rye kernels. Um, uh, lots of other types of seeds, flax seeds and flax meal, um, which, by the way, can uh, reduce menopausal symptoms. But uh, a couple of tablespoons of flax meal has been shown to reduce menopausal symptoms in some women. Um, so that's one of my favorite breads. I think it probably is, is common knowledge, but I just want to have you say it. What are the goals in terms of utilizing this kind of diet? Well, 80% of all heart disease is either preventable or reversible. 70% of cancer, 70% of GI disease, either preventable or reversible with what you eat and how you live. I don't think we need the kind of disability that we have in this country. I mean, never mind the, the mortality where, um, uh, and COVID has set us back at some years with that as sure. well. But the fact that we can prevent most disease and reverse most disease, that it has a similar root cause, whether it is uh, um, any of those diseases uh, or brain disease, particularly Alzheimer's Alzheimer's and other dementias. It's all rooted in the idea of excessive oxidation and excessive chronic inflammation in the body. If we eat an anti-inflammatory diet, if we eat a diet that is primarily whole foods and not primarily super processed foods that, as I said, you can wad up into a ball and throw across the room, you can have a profound effect on this and more importantly, feel really well. It's one thing to tell people that um, they have a reduced mortality, that they're going to live longer. It's another thing to say, you're going to feel better next week and I'm going to show you how. And, and actually mean it and be able to prove it in the life of an individual patient and in the life of um, their family. Because what happens to one person has a wonderful ripple effect in medicine, as you know, to the people with whom they're closest. And that is so powerful. And that's why I'm in this. You know, neither one of us have to do this, right? But we're here because we we believe that we can still make a difference for people who want to take control of their own health. And it's simpler and easier and less complicated than most people have been led to believe. Yeah, I think that's the key message. I noticed on your website that you do suggest some supplements. So can you talk a little bit about what supplements you might recommend um, and for what reasons? I do suggest some supplements. And I think that given the realities of our diet in this day and age, that it's helpful to have supplements as insurance, which is kind of how I look at them. Um, I still take a multivitamin. I take vitamin D3 and I take uh, turmeric, which is curcumin with a little piperine, which is the black pepper uh, compound that helps you absorb it. I think all of those three have a role. I think vitamin C has a role in shortening upper respiratory infections and uh, I think magnesium may have a role for some people um, and uh, I'm quite interested in uh, glutathione and whether supplementing that as a supplement can work as a master antioxidant and anti-inflammatory. Um, I think uh, I suggest that some people take zinc and quercetin when they want to boost their immunity and protect themselves from COVID. And if somebody wanted to know how much to take, is that available in your books or should they talk to their doctors? I'd like them to talk to their doctors. That would be great. 
uh, because <laughs> then doctors will learn about it. <laughs> Good answer. You mentioned COVID. And so one of the other areas is immune function. And you talked about inflammation and uh, oxidative stress. So I would assume that this would also contribute to your immune function as well. Absolutely. And actually, you know, as you know, what's good for you that a lot of people don't know is being outside for their immune function. You know, I've become interested in this idea that there is a nature based medicine that isn't just about the planet going to hell, although it may be. Uh, but in, but instead that nature actually can have a positive and beneficial effect. At this point, we're going to end this episode. As I mentioned, there was so much great information in this interview, we've divided our discussion into two episodes. In part two, I speak more with Dr. LaPuma about the effect of nature on our health and ways to incorporate more aspects of it in our lives. It's easier than you might think, and the benefits are significant. Please join us. Our episode was produced by Patrick Shambayati and me, and our associate producer is Kyla McMillian. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to tune in to part two. In the meantime, be well.